Okay, I think we are live, Dr. Michael. Thanks for being here, man. Um, yeah, go, uh, go, go ahead. Oh, Chris, thank you so much for having me. You don't have to call me Dr. Michael. It's just fine. Okay. Um, yeah, like I respect people who go after those PhDs, man, especially. So uh, I figured, you know, it's well-deserved just to give you that, that doctor quote right there. But, but you know, funny story. The only time I ever really use it is when you're traveling and you're at the airline desk and that like that, the wonderful flight attendant just being so difficult. And she's like, well, Mr. Jake, I'm afraid I can. Uh, that's doctor. <laughs> that's the only time. Does that actually work right there? Do they go back a little uh, bit? No, it doesn't. But it makes oh. me feel better. <laughs> well, before we uh, start taking a deep dive here, though, why don't you I always hate doing this, but why don't you give you like a small introduction so the listeners and everyone kind of knows who we're dealing with here, so to speak. You yeah. Know, small brief thing. Absolutely. So here's a quick version. So I was born in Northern Michigan, tiny town, pretty poor family, pretty abusive father. Ooh. So my father in sixth grade goes to jail because his abuse stepped up to a whole nother level. He's in jail for 10 years. I get raised in a home with a single mom. I kind of get this thing where like, I'm, I don't want to be this guy. Like, I don't want to live this life. So I busted out of there. I, you know, work my butt off. I work up, I go to Cornell. I get my PhD in chemistry. I'm like, right. that's it. I've escaped, right? Sure. So I go get my first job. I'm working on a research job for Intel. I get married. I start having kids and bam, oh my gosh, I'm becoming my father. This was, this was shocking to me, right? And because all of a sudden I start seeing the themes coming out, anger, uncontrolled anger, themes of lust, themes of like, who is this guy that lives inside of me? Now, praise the Lord by the grace of God. I never reached the levels that he did, but the, I saw the first starting footprints and I said, no, I am not going to become that guy. And that's what launched me into this adventure that ultimately has brought me here to you today. The adventure of trying to discover what makes me tick? Why is this piece of me there? Psycholo psychologically speaking, what's going on inside of my brain? And and why is it that despite my determination to become someone different, I found myself, this is now 11 years ago, going to, on the footsteps of the path I didn't want to be on. Now, since then, I've discovered life coaching, the power of our thoughts to determine what happens around us. I've discovered a myriad of self-help books, reading all sorts of different types of books, everything from psychology texts to comedy, just trying right. to understand what goes on here. And I got to tell you what, Chris, I now have the best job in the world. I've left the corporate world behind, big transition. Golden handcuffs are hard to let go of. But now I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a life coach. I help guys everywhere go down the journey that I was on, but hopefully quite a bit faster. Wow, man. That was that was quite a load right there. So here's what I, well, I don't know if it's really a question, but I, you know, based on what you said, since your father did it and you started finding traits in yourself with it, you know, I've read and listened to a bunch of different clinical psychologists and never took a deep dive, but you know, do you think it's kind of just in your, in the DNA and kind of inherited passed down like that is the reason you started to get these traits a little bit later in life or exposing these traits, however you want to say it. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of a joke about this. This boy comes home from school one day and he's got a really bad report card. He walks into his father's office. He slaps it down his father's desk and says, well, what do you think, dad, genetics or environment? And you know, it's, it's hard to say exactly which it is. I can imagine that dad's so kind of trapped there, right? Whichever he picks, he's in trouble. <laughs> and I, I think a lot of it is training. A lot of it for me, to be honest, Chris, was that I did not know how to be a man. Hmm. I had one example growing up. And as much as I didn't like that one example, what we underestimate is as human beings, we are always looking for a role model to follow. You cannot help but do that. Like as much as you like to think, I'm not going to do that. It, it's impossible. We're always looking for one. I had this one example, and that was my only way I knew how to be a man. And so part of this was a great deal of training. Now, genetically, I'm sure there are genetic components. You know, the discovery of all the different genetic factors is ongoing. I have no doubt tendencies towards temper probably brought my grandfather, my great uncles, all of them short tempers. But separating those two out, it's very hard to do. Wow, man. Yeah. I mean, so it seems like that, you know, I, I don't know how to I'm trying to put my thoughts together here while, while I think, but you know, a lot of, a lot of people come from this situation. They don't really know. They don't have anybody to look up to like a lot of, you know, especially in today's times for whatever reason, they don't have a role model. They don't have somebody that's, that can be a, you know, a mentor role model in their eyes. So, you know, the, the mind is like a, such a sponge at that age. And, you know, the first things they're seeing that kind of just, you know, just, it just soaks it up right up and they think, Oh, this is what being a man is. But it's not until like you got lucky enough. We're not even lucky enough. You just, I don't know if it was discipline, courage, or whatever you want to call it, but you decided, heck with this, man, I want to go do my own thing. And there's gotta be a different way. And, you know, I applaud that dude. And I don't think, do you think a lot of people just get stuck in those ruts and just, well, this is how it's going to be, man. I'm, 
Absolutely. The, the big data sets confirm this. 90% of people, it's easy to measure money. So all the easy numbers always come to money. Sure. 90% of people will make within 10% plus or minus what their parents make when they're the same age. We never really escape, not never, we rarely escape the brackets that we grow up in. But, but think about it this way, Chris, for all of time, we lived in these small communities. 200 people is about the number of relationships our brain can really handle well. Okay. And so what that means though, is you got your dad, you had probably another 10 dads in the community. And so you're intimately watching all of them. You're connected to all of them. So you have this diverse. So even if you have a dad that says, you know, misguided as mine was, there's mm -hmm. other dads there. But in our culture now, we're isolated. We don't have that anymore. Do you think, yeah, I mean, part of it that, you know, we're not really taught how to be, and I, when I say we, I mean, males right now are not really taught how to be vulnerable and express these feelings, you know, growing up now that, you know, if you do express these type of feelings, oh, you're not masculine enough. And, you know, and it kind of leads you down like, you know, a dark road and you don't really know how to control your emotions, control your feelings. So you just shove them down deep down in your stomach or whatever. And then that kind of, have you ever heard of the, um, the dark triad? Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. So I, that's what I've kind of been looking at lately, you know, and for those who don't know what it is, it's and correct me if I'm wrong, Machiavellianism, narcissism and psychopathy. Yep. 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 Yeah. Psychopaths. Yeah. Yep. And totally true. And so there's there's a lot of different things going on here. But I first want to emphasize what you just said. As men today, every single male role model that we are given is either absolutely emotionless, except, of course, for lust. All they all have lots of lust or an utter buffoon like Homer Simpson. Like, that's it. Show me the good, deep, connected to his emotions, man, that she'll still show strength through his emotional connection and vulnerability anywhere in Hollywood. It, it, the image just doesn't exist there. So what are we as men supposed to aim for? We're not showing this anywhere. Yeah. I mean, is it just is that just because of the media, you think, like you just said in Hollywood and they portray like, hey, we won't. This is what, you know, every man should be like always. But it doesn't always have to be like that. Right. Well, we're, we, we start venturing a little into speculation into why. Um, there's all sorts of different theories we could bring up. I'm not really sure the why matters so much because mm -hmm. when the rubber meets the road, here we have a bunch of guys that don't have a wide assortment of male role models, that don't have a good image anywhere in movie or hero worship style stuff. Because all of us guys, whether it's sports, whatever, we all have hero worship. We all do it, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we just don't have that role model. And the reason why it almost isn't even important because when I come in as a coach, the first thing I have to do is help a guy identify who am I? What is it to me a man? Am I a man? And if so, am I good enough? And am I worthy of the good things in my life? Does these questions shake a man to his core if he does not know the answer? So the type of clients you're working with are what you just said that, you know, they're typically men and who are kind of lost their way and are maybe addicted to Drugs, alcohol, pornography, just something that's leading them down the dark arts or whatever, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I, I would say it this way. You take a guy who's like, I know there's more to life. I've got a mediocre marriage. It's kind of cold. You know, I have a job. I do it. It's fine. My kids largely ignore me. And they're like, you're missing that spark, the spark yeah. that, you know, deep down we were known to have. I love the way Jordan Peterson decides or describes rather the power of purpose and responsibility to giving meaning to your life. And when you have that meaning, there's no comparison. Like all of a sudden you stand up taller, your shoulders are back. Yeah. It's everything seems more worthwhile. And, and when you don't have it, you're just kind of drifting like, yeah, I did the thing. I guess I'll have another beer. Why not? And I mean, don't get me wrong. I love beer. I'm a home brewer. But I think we all know when we're using alcohol, porn, or anything to try to escape the world versus trying to live it to its best. Well, I agree right there with you. But, you know, is it because, you know, like you just said, that people just haven't found their passions yet and they get stuck in these negative comfort zones? And... Yeah, go ahead. And yeah, negative comfort zone and just that, you know, they, they reward themselves with that beer pornography at the end of the day and they don't realize exactly how it is impacting the, like, the people around them and how it's impacting them mentally and physically. So that's a reward system and they get stuck in that negative behavioral pattern, I guess, also. And this goes on a loop. We're going to have to jump a little bit into brain chemistry to answer that question. So let's talk about dopamine. Everyone now talks about dopamine. Dopamine is super popular. Cool. Dopamine is just kind of the reward endorphin chemical hormone that you release in your head that it makes you go, oh, yay, I feel good. Right. Sure. So as human beings, we love to chase dopamine. Now, here's what's interesting. The natural sources of dopamine, there's a natural balance when you have this responsibility, a life well lived, feels great, but doesn't overwhelm your system. 
The artificial sources of dopamine, pornography, excessive alcohol consumption, uh, high risk sports or, or high risk driving, whatever, like you find whatever you need to do. There's all these different ways to artificially get a huge dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. And what those do is those actually numb out the rest of life. And so if you, I'll use the most common example, pornography, there are now, there's now an epidemic of young men who do pornography so aggressively that they're unable to physically perform with a real biological woman. Yeah. And think about that for a second. Like they've, they've rewired their brain so much, but this is what happens when we use these artificial dopamine hits. And I think a lot of times what it comes from is far more simple than I don't know my passions. It could be as little as this. Let's say that I grow up and I don't have a good relationship with my mother. All of a sudden, I think girls don't like me. I get into middle school. Uh, girls don't like me, kind of shy away. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When I think that thought, I create that reality. Why? Because I act reserved. I act. I don't have confidence. You know, we all know that if you act like a wimp around a girl and don't kind of go up and ask her out, you're probably not going to get a lot of dates. Sure. Well, this spirals. It goes into high school. Now it's even worse. It goes into college. And now this poor guy, if, if a girl even looks at him, he's going to drop whatever he's holding, run for terror because he has convinced himself that he is not good with women. And so because of that, where else is he going to turn? He has zero dopamine, the healthy path. What does that leave left? Pornography. But these thoughts, we have these thoughts all day long. And most of us speak to ourselves in our mind using a language and a tone that we would be aghast if anyone else ever spoke to us that way or if we spoke to someone else that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. As somebody, I forgot who I was talking to, but it said, you know, they think about who you talk to the most in your life and it's always yourself. And that never, yeah, that blew my mind. I was like, that makes total sense. I never even realized that. But, and also kind of touching with what you said about dopamine hits and faster driving and, you know, these two, and, you know, I've talked to uh, somebody who actually specialized in porn addiction with men on here once a couple of times and, or once before. And um, basically, it's just like saying what you said, they chase those dopamine hits. And then when they kind of level out, then it gets, you know, they go into hardcore more stuff, you know, looking at more like, let's go faster driving, you know, let's do more things just to keep getting that dopamine hit. And they reach this level that, you know, it's just almost insanity where it goes. And then they realize, you know, they five years, 10 years later, they don't know, realize what happened to them. You know, it's like they didn't ask questions. They kept going down that road and they wonder why kind of what you're saying. Ooh, wait, well, where'd my life go? Why am I in a rut now? Why am I in this negative spiral downhill? You know, why did I lose my job? Why did I lose my family? So it's wild, man. It is. But but the good news is, A, they're not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of people, both genders, that are just stuck in these ruts right now in our culture. And B, there's hope. You can change. The power of your thoughts is in both directions. I, I, I've done experiments with my own children. I'm that sort of parent where I will plant thoughts in them, let them kind of ruminate on those thoughts and get the results and then point out I just planted the thought. It's very fun, but it works at all ages, including your age and my age, sure. where what we choose to think becomes reality. And it's very, very hard to change what we think on our own. Sometimes we need an external kick in the butt. It could be a great book that explains something. It could be a great mentor. It could be a life coach. It could be a great podcast episode that challenges us. Whoa, maybe there is a different way to think about it. But at any age, you can change your thinking and that will change your reality. I guarantee it. So yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. You know I mean, so you take one little small change and you just kind of grow off that. So like, what's a tool? Like, what if, what's a thought that you would put in somebody's head to make that change? Yeah, I'm going to pull up a recent example here. Okay. Um, I was talking to a guy who's having some troubles with his in-laws. All right. And he made some monetary troubles. And his in-laws are making some choices that aren't great. He thinks they're reckless with money. Let's put it that way. And all of a sudden, they show up at the door knocking for money, right? And so he's all grumpy and bitter. And he's like, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, this happened exactly the way I knew it would. They're no good. They don't know how to handle money. And I said, dude, let's just pause and look at what's happening here. Now, if this guy is a very reserved guy. He never said any of this out loud. This was all going on in his head. Sure. And he said, how do you feel when you think these thoughts? And he said, oh, I'm bitter and I'm resentful and I'm angry about the situation. I'm like, cool. How does that show up in your life when you're feeling bitter and angry? And he describes what he does. He pulls back from his family. He doesn't connect well with his own wife, with his own children. He does a poor job at work because he's ruminating about this injustice all day long at work, right? I'm like, dude, is that how you want to live your life? And he's like, no. I'm like, I, I, it's not even like it's hurting them. You're only hurting yourself. That's the right. thing about bitterness is we get bitter and we think somehow the other person suffers, but if they don't, it's just us. And I say, look, I don't know if this is true, but what if they just have massive brain defects? For all we know, like they could just have like, there's different mental capabilities. There's, they're both quite a bit older. What if they just have both have early onset Alzheimer's, 
right? Like, yeah. I'm not trying to be mean here, but I said, what if that were the case? How would that change? He'd be like, well, I'm still not going to give him money. I'm like, I don't care if you give him money. I care about what you're thinking. And if you can think a thought that puts you into a space of a more positive emotion, of a more openness to the world, then all of a sudden you have a better life. And I don't care two bits about whether he gives the money or not. The point is his life to live, if he wants to live with a full life, full of joy and peace, the thought, oh my gosh, these guys did exactly what I told them not to. They're totally worthless. They're draining me dry. That thought's not serving him, whether it's true or not. So kick that thought out and put in the thought, maybe they have, maybe they have early onset Alzheimer's, but I can still love them from afar. It's interesting, man. Like, uh, yeah, it's these little small changes that, you know, I read, I was reading, um, I think it's a compound effect and, you know, it's one of these things that, you know, if you make little small changes, like change your mindset on how you look at things and like, you just don't have to go all out and say like day one, day two, I'm a completely new man. I'm going to be a, a nine all day long. And then, you know, at, then when I get home, I'll be a 10, you know, as far as energy levels and positive thoughts and whatever, but you know, you set yourself up for success. And then, so you day one, you say like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, change my, you know, the way I do things as far as I'm not going to watch six hours of TV or whatever, you know, I'm going to walk a lap around the neighborhood, then maybe, you know, eat, eat a healthy dinner. Then like day two or the first day or wait, week one, you do that. Then week two, you say, okay, I'm going to walk two laps around my neighborhood and eat a totally. healthy dinner for lunch and dinner. And you just, you set yourself up for success. So yeah, I agree hundred percent with these little small changes. And I feel like sometimes it's easier said than done when I say things like that, just because, you know, I've never really had any addiction issues at all besides, just, you know, I like to work it out and stuff, but that's my thing to kind of release and stuff. But, you know, I mean, with you though, I mean, you know, you're working with people who probably, you know, who are addicted to like alcohol, for example, and it's just, you know, it's almost alcoholism that runs in a family and it's just really tough to kick something like that. Correct. Oh, it can be exceedingly difficult. Yeah. But we have to separate out in these, like alcohol is a great example because there's oftentimes a chemical component as well. Sure. And, and when there's a chemical component, it's time to bring in a licensed physician. And that that's a little bit different of a scenario there sometimes. However, oftentimes the way I tell people to think of it is imagine like a large ocean going freight vessel, right? Yeah. You throw your rudder to the left, your ship doesn't just stop and instantly go left, right? Like, you know, it's just not how that large of a vessel works. And you're much more like that, your psycho-emotional self than you'd like to think. And so even if it's just as little as stopping what I call a shame cycle, a shame cycle is a brutal thing that we all get ourselves trapped in. Let me describe it super quick. Go ahead. So let's say that I'm addicted to porn. Okay. But I, I don't like that about myself. And I click on, click, 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 click. I watch some porn. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so horrible. I did that thing again that I know I shouldn't do. And I just did it. I'm the worst person in the world. How do I feel? I feel horrible. Sure. How do I soothe feeling horrible? I go back and I click on more porn. It's a cycle and you shame cycle your way on in. And the thing about shame cycles is they are everywhere in life and they are wholly destructive. And here's how it plays into this sort of small change. You'll make a small change. You know, and you'll take day one. I did a lap around the block. I ate my healthy dinner. Yay. Day two, my girlfriend's super mad at me. My boss wanted me to stay late. There's no lap around the block. That's yeah. it. I'm back to my horrible ways. I'm a horrible person again. Yeah. Shame cycle. Boom, 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 boom. Right. Yeah horrible thing to let yourself engage in if you ever catch yourself in a shame cycle just say no i'm not going to participate i'm doing my best let it go yeah i have one of those things that instead of just saying that i usually use like a, a red stop sign in my head that if i start to you know say for example this is i got i'm i like chips you know and i, I know it's like if i get off my diet or whatever i'll just i love eating chips man it's like a weakness but i start eating them it's like i put up a red flag in my head like dude you gotta stop man this is not you you know i mean that's just you know a weird example i'm usually pretty good but yeah for things like that things like i know i shouldn't be doing or hey this is not the path you want to be on i'll just put up a red stop sign in my head and say stop go sit down go reflect again you know reset your batteries back to neutral get back up start over and then i forgive myself you know okay you had one accident no big deal you know, exactly. Start, exactly. Start over. You'll be fine, dude. It's not the end of the world. Compassion to yourself is the most important person you can show compassion to. And the reason why is you can never give to compassion to someone else. If you're not compassionate to yourself. You can fake it and you'll fool a lot of people. But deep down, if you loathe yourself, it's impossible to present authentic compassion elsewhere. It just doesn't work, psychologically speaking. Do you like that? You know, a lot of people say fake it till you make it. And yes, and so, but you have to understand what it means. When it, when it understands faking towards and make it, it can be incredibly effective. I call it more like practice. You're just going to keep practicing. But in order to do it, there's a critical part that has to also take place in your head, which is I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And so you start going through the motions. And yes, it can be very powerful, but don't be confused. The other person doesn't know the difference. Hmm. Okay. I'm with you right there. 
Yeah, I've always heard that. And, you know, I used to say it, but I was just kind of like, eh, I don't know if that's really a good saying. When I until I started thinking about it, you know, fake it till you make it. And it's like, well, did I really make it if I just faked it the whole time, you know? And, but yeah, I like what you said about it, though. And I don't know if a lot of people, you know, sometimes I feel like I talk in memes just because it's I'm on Instagram or whatever, and that's all I'm seeing. And so, you, you know, and I feel like a lot of that, do I have any original thoughts? And, uh, and I just go along kind of like, oh, yeah, that makes sense at point. You know, at some point, but then again, like when I try to sit down and reflect about my day and think about what's going on, I was like, take it till you make it. Is that really what I thought it meant? So, well, it's hard. You, when you only have five words, it, how can you capture something so deep as the power of your thoughts and perception to create reality around you in just a couple of words? And so if you just take it as like a, a broad sweep of a good thing to do, sure. But if you want to go deeper and have real results, understand what's going on inside your own head. And then it really works. How does one go down, you know, just deep, get deeper inside their head and kind of figure it out? Do you think journaling, meditation, you know? Journaling can be incredibly powerful. Meditation, if you're of the Christian inclination, like I am prayer, very, very, very powerful ways to get in there. Um, The first thing, though, I would encourage people to do is to give yourself permission to be human, to have a past, that all this terrible stuff that you're about to dredge up is there because at some point in your life, it helped to keep you safe. I just was uh, working with a guy who had this very cold father, all right? And he learned to turn to his mother for emotional comfort, Mm -hmm. all right? And this became deeply ingrained in him. Of course, it leads, where would you guess, to pornography? And because he was trained from the youngest age, the only way to find emotional comfort is to use a woman's body to get there. And it's easy to stand back and say, well, that's disgusting and sick and wrong and perverted. How could you feel that way? And that's not helpful. The truth is there's a good reason why he was there. It's not his fault. His dad was emotionally disconnected from him and that his mother only would just hold him, but didn't have the deeper connection as well. That was what he was trained. Now, it's not healthy. We don't want him to stay there. We want him to have real, deep, meaningful connections with both genders in the appropriate way. But you have to start with compassion. And his first journaling is going to start with that. And if he writes that down and says, I'm the most sick and twisted soul ever, it's all over. You cannot heal from that point. Compassion towards yourself. I like that. It makes perfect sense. You know, and kind of talking about journaling, this might be a little off topic, but, you know, Jordan Peterson, speaking of him, was talking about how, you know, journaling can be real powerful and make you a dangerous man just because, you know, you get your thoughts, you know, being articulate, I guess is what he was saying. It's just, right. yeah, you write down your thoughts and, you know, you learn to express your, you know, work them out and you have arguments and, you know, you learn to speak very well about things and then you become dangerous, man. And you just, you make your own uniqueness kind of, you're very self-aware, I feel like, you know, and I've, I've been doing it. I've been dabbling in it. I, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you know, maybe once a week, you know, cause cause, you know, it's one of those things like, I don't really have time right now. I put it off, but I, I, I try to sit down and make myself like on Sunday. Sorry, do it for just 10 minutes, do it 15, but I'm learning to get better at it. And it's one of those things that, yeah, when I start doing it, like I feel better afterwards. It's like, Oh, that makes sense now that I wrote it down and that, you know, and you can actually fill it out in your head rather than just trying to think of it on the spot. It's sort of like what I'm doing right now, but, but yeah, it makes perfect sense. There's a lot of power. in it. And, and there's also tremendous power in the journaling process when you write down something that's negative, and this is a part of your dark side, if you want to go to like you and speak, like you're, you're the dark part of you, yeah. to be able to look at that part with compassion and love and say, yeah, that is part of me, is essential to finding that power and that dangerousness. Uh, let me, I'll use my own story for that. The part of me that in my father led to him becoming abusive is a very, very strong desire to affect change in the world and left to its own devices. It goes bad. But in order for me to become the man you see me as now, I had to look at that and say, yeah, I have that. I have a dark side. But you know what? Properly harnessed, that dark side makes me strong. And using that journal, writing that out, exploring what's going on inside Michael? What are his good parts? What are his lighter sides? What are his darker sides? And learning to accept all of them, put them together. That's what psychologists would call becoming integrated and having all these different pieces that fit together. Now you've got some real strength to work with. Yeah, you know, I I know... There's nobody, obviously, that's perfect. No human being that I know of anyway. So if you know your weaknesses, you know your dark side, you can you know almost, I don't want to say use it to his advantage, but you know that, you know, where your hiccups can be. And then you can just use that. It's like, all right, you know, I know how I act. I'm very self-aware now. And I know that if I'm going on this downward spiral and it's very, you got to be very self-aware and just, you know, I don't really know why people don't try to do things more often to try to be more self-aware. And I guess it's kind of what we, it's scary. And it's yeah, embarrassing. There we go. Yeah. No, yeah. No one and, looks like an idiot or a fool. So that's well, my dark side looks a lot like a jerk. 
Like I'm just gonna call it what it is. And so you probably already know since our conversation, I tend to have a very aggressive personality. I'm to be right up there. I say what it is, right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uncontained, you do that with your wife in the wrong moment or your girlfriend, good luck. Yeah. But properly harnessed, let's say my wife's having some trouble with some utility company, like an internet company comes up all the time because sure. you know we live rural, internet stuff is down. They don't want to send out a repair guy. Oh, she yes. calls, they blow her off. I call the guys out here in 10 minutes. And now you harness that ability to be like, dude, you're getting out here, you're fixing this internet right now. And that's just what's going to happen. In the right time, in the right direction, that dark side becomes a great strength. But you have to know what it is and know how it works in order to direct it in the right direction. So did you just do a lot of, you know, when you were in college and just a lot of your life experiences, that's just how you found out what your dark side was and just, you know, journaling and your own little practices and like, all right, this is how I am and I know it, but you learned how to harness it, like you said. Let me tell you a quick story about that. Okay. So I worked for Intel and I was there for a year and a half and I was promoted. I was very successful in Intel and I get this group, four people directly reporting to me. Okay. One year after I'm promoted, my boss calls me in, Michael, we got to talk. Sure. What's up, boss? Long story short, every single one, all four people want to leave because they cannot stand working for you because you are so abrasive. They just can't stand it. And I was like, oh, gut punch. This is Michael encountering his lack of awareness. My boss looks at me, though, and I respect the heck out of him for this. He says, I see the potential in you. And if you're willing to take direction, I'll give you another group and you can try again. And he did. And he was ruthless. Every email I put out, I BCC'd him and he would respond back, going through every single sentence where I said something was too harsh, inconsiderate, where I didn't properly focus on what the right thing was, where I tried to micromanage people, all these different things. And between that and my desire to change, reading tons of books, journaling myself, two years after that, one of the guys from my original group was in a group meeting with me. And as the group meeting ends, we're walking out, he grabs me almost roughly by the shoulder and says, Michael, we got to talk. We, we jump into a different conference room. And he's like, what happened to you? I'm like, what do you mean, Josh? He's like, I was in that room with you two years ago and you're not the same person. And I like this guy a whole lot more. So I want to know what happened because I want to do that too. And I was like, whoa, that's kind of cool. Sure. And, and Josh and I became great friends, actually. We, our, our fr we rebuilt our friendship after that. And that's a story for a second time. But finding someone who's willing to pull you aside and say, I see what's going on here and there's great potential, but you're missing it. Yeah. And that is so powerful. It's very, very powerful. And it's also, I see a lot of power in just saying, no, I don't know. Or, you know, just flat out saying, I don't know, or even saying no to something that you don't want to do. And, you know, you get caught up in something that, you know, just makes you angry and makes you, you know, just a terrible person. But yeah, there's a couple of different things like that, man. Just, you know, you and your knowing yourself and learning to take a stand at one point. And, but yeah. Yeah, man, it's powerful stuff that, you know, I never, I didn't really feel like I learned on my way, like during college and stuff that, you know, until it was afterwards and like just kind of, you know, reading books and podcasts and stuff and like self-reflecting. It's, like, hmm, it's okay to do these things. And I'm not saying go out there and go cuss out your boss or anything by any means, but take these little wins and, you know, you know, and work on and work on that and work on yourself. Yeah. Just like you've been saying the whole time. It's, it's awesome. You know, I think one of the great sadnesses I have is that college doesn't really teach you how to be a good person anymore. College used to teach you how to understand these complex parts. It's why all the great literature is the great literature. You read through all of it. It reveals the good and the bad and how the hero goes from being disintegrated, puts himself together and presents a strong, unified, integrated front and gets the girl, writes the injustice, whatever the story is. It's all the same motto. It's the hero's journey from being like, you know, take a look at Luke Skywalker, hot mess, doesn't know himself, certainly doesn't know his dark side. Sure. To Luke's guy with a Jedwag, he's conquered his dark side, knows how it makes him strong, but still can hold to the light. Yeah, I'm in I'm very in belief if you gotta have these humbling experiences throughout your life just to kind of know that it, you're not always gonna be the big dog, you're not always gonna hit the game winning shot. You know, you probably will get rejected by the girl eventually. And you know, you learn oh, yeah. yeah, and that's been part of you know, part of my life. You know, I learned how to lose, I learned from mistakes and I build off of it or try to build off of it and just learn that I'm not gonna make that mistake again. Let's go forward from here, you know. And, you know, shit happens, like for a better word, and you just move on, man. And it's tough. It sucks. I'm not saying it's great, and I don't want anybody to experience it, but I feel like part of it, you do have to experience some of these things in order to figure out, you know, who you really are and what you're made of. I tell people there's lots of different ways to grow. You can choose to do it the very, very hard way, where you just keep smashing your head into the wall until eventually <laughs> you're like, my goodness, why do I have run out of Band-Aids? Because my headset just always has a Band-Aid on it. You can do it the kind of hard way where you're like, you smash once, you're like, oh, that's not great. I guess I should do something. Or you can do it the faster way where you find someone to get you some help. 
And it comes in lots of different ways. It used to be, again, 200 years ago, you had the old timers in the village. They couldn't hunt anymore because all the old men would sit around the campfire, you know, doing some task. And yeah. the young men would come sit at their feet and the old men would just talk to them. And this wisdom flow and wisdom is a concept that our culture has lost so much of. We have endless knowledge at our fingertips. One smartphone device, you pick it up, more knowledge than the ancients could ever conceive. And yet we have almost no wisdom in our common life. Yeah, we were talking about this the other day. I mean, some friends at the gym were talking about how, you know, Elon Musk said that we're considered a cyborg right now because we always have a screen in our hand and we have endless information, just like you said. But, you know, if you compare that, you know, back to our primal days, I mean, you could come up and tell me that you killed the biggest deer in the world, but nobody could ever fact check you and no one ever knew. And you could tell me you discovered, you know, fire. Like, OK, cool. You know, and how many liars there were back then? Obviously, you didn't do that. But yeah, it was just like how weird it was and how much we've grown with technology and that. You know, and I like to ask this question to you because I feel like um, or ask questions like this because I feel like I have trouble with it, that we're in this information overload and that my brain was not made to handle it. And sometimes I just wonder to myself, like, am I doing too much? Is this, Am I trying to accept too much information? And that's why I tried to journal a little bit just because like get some of it out. You know, it's like my brain just going, you know, 100 percent at all times. And is that bad or good? I, I think it's not necessarily so much that we have an information overload, but that we have too much specifically calibrated emotional content coming in. Mm. So there's now a number of documentaries that have been made about what the designers of apps for your phone, for your PC, for whatever, are trying to do. And they're trying to capture your attention sure. by any way possible. But how do they do that? If they just simply filled your smartphone with, say, I don't know, geographical coordinates of every city around the world. That would not capture your attention. Uh -huh. Tons and tons of data, but you'd be like, dude, I don't care that whatever is that 39.75216 comma minus 115, whatever, right? I can't even finish one, let alone the thought. So the app designers have done things to play psychological games on you and me and all of us, yep. trying to whip us around and pull on our emotional control centers to get us glued to these devices. And that's what I think the difference is. I take my kids camping a lot. We love the outdoors. We live in Northern Idaho. And one of the things I love the most is you get this group of kids out in the woods, right? And a lot of them, they're different families, a lot of them spend a lot of time in devices. They spend their first hour or two kind of shocked. And they're like, nothing's happening. Nothing's grabbing my attention. And after that first hour passes, they just start running off in the woods with their friends. And they just lose themselves in this incredibly healthy, authentic way, which right. is how they're meant to be. They come back. They're full of life. They, they're tired. They sleep well. Their whole body realigns itself to the way that we're meant to be. We aren't meant to have ourselves jerked around the way these devices do. Mm -hmm. if, if I make this practical, I encourage you and everyone else, turn the darn thing off. At least flip it upside down and put it somewhere else right. out of the way. You will sleep better. You will get yourself out in the world more, have real connections with people, sit down and play a card game with someone. It doesn't have to be fancy, just something to have a real connection with a real person. And that will feed your body and your soul so much more. Yeah. Adam Alter in his book, Addiction, he actually talks a bit about that. I don't know if you've read that, but he actually talks about how, you know, they, you know, the CEOs, you know, didn't even, won't even let their children play with these things or use right. it much. Yeah. Just because they know the effects on it and what it might do. I mean, but you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I mean, did you and your wife, you know, talk about your know, screen time with your kids? I don't have any kids. Oh, absolutely. And like how much? Uh, you, no, it's a huge discussion. Time. Oh, okay. So, so we do allow us on our screen time, but we're very controlling about it. And most of all, what we do is we control which apps they have access to. Nice. They're almost exclusively educational apps. They all have timers on them. Um, but for example, we homeschool. And so a significant amount of our homeschooling, we have a math app that's appropriate for each child. We have a reading app whether it's like, you know, the younger ones get like a little word that pops up in phonetics and that kind of stuff, right? But we specifically choose ones that do not have commercials. We choose ones that meet our values overall. And we put timers on it. And the rules are very harsh. If I don't have that device plugged back in at a station, when your time is up, you don't get it tomorrow. And because of that, like, I'm not going to deny, I'm sure the apps are doing some of their kids, but also like, this is, this is like every parent has to make their own calls, right? Like there's no right answer to this. But what my wife and I decided is we want our children to at least be exposed to a little bit about what's coming. So it's not like a complete falling off a cliff when they become 18, move out of the house and get a smartphone. That's the first time they ever see one. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's just a matter of finding that balance, but it's just, you know, I have no, you know, 
practical or practice in that just because like I said, I don't have any kids, but I've always liked to have conversations with people who talk about, you know, oh, just give them the phone and let them run wild or whatever, just because, you know, they go, oh, it keeps them quiet. You just give them a screen in front of their hands. And it does, know, it does, so but you take it away. Is that, but is that the best way to do things? I'm just watch the screen all day. I mean, and like I said, I'm not advocating, I'm on the fence about it just because I don't really know, but it's interesting to hear people's thoughts on it. Just like, you know, cause you know, that obviously cognitively, how is this developing over time? You know, their mind. Yeah. I think healthy parents are experimentalists. Let me give you a great example of that. When my uh, children, oldest was five, she had this theory that she did not want to eat anything but pancakes for breakfast. All right. And okay. so here's the experiment we designed. I would design, choose a breakfast. It could be like something healthy, like maybe say eggs and sausage or something like pancakes with syrup. Okay. I would write it in a journal. I would not tell my wife. My wife would record how many times she had to give the kiddos a timeout. After a week of this, we put the two notes together. And I'll give you one guess where the correlation was. Oh, but of yeah. course, Tons of sugar, tons of pancakes, <laughs> all the time out. It's like there's a couple in the other pile, but it was so highly correlated. I'm sure. Right? Sure. So even at five, you go back and you say, look, here's the deal. When you have pancakes, you tend to get five timeouts. When you have eggs, you tend to get one. We're going to choose eggs. And you try it out. And it changes at different ages. Different ages need to have different screen time rules. You can't treat an 11 or 12 year old the same way you do a three or four year old. No, I agree. Yeah, it's completely different, you know balance right there a completely different person you're looking with and you're someone who's three years old someone who's you know a teenager almost and yeah completely different life experience and past they've already taken so yeah it makes perfect sense that i mean but you also you don't want them to be completely out you know i've heard other people tell me that no we won't have any screen time and it's like well what do you do when they actually go to school and then they're you know all their friends have one and they don't have one and they're the outcast now and then they hate you know they rebel against you just for that so yeah it's just it's wild man it's, it's interesting one thing I tell parents right now is this is such a hard time to be a parent. And to be honest, I think that's one of the reasons why more and more couples are choosing not to have children. Because this time, being a parent, so much more is expected. The social shame factor is through the roof, like especially for moms, especially for moms. As dads, we don't have it as bad. I just got to call a spade a spade. Like I will take, we have six kids. I'll take all six kids with me to the grocery store. And every couple walks by, you're a hero. You're amazing, <laughs> right? My, my wife, mom, takes six kids to the store. And like one kid will squeak one time the whole way through the grocery store and everyone glares at her. Why don't you control your kids better? And I, my heart goes out to her. Like it's, I'll give you a hint who does most of the grocery shopping here. Right. <laughs> and, but like, this is just a reality. It's really a hard time to be a parent. Um, we have challenges now that never occurred throughout human history. The challenges of electronics, communications, and all the stuff invading our household just didn't exist for all of time. And so we're in this totally new age and all of us are figuring it out from scratch. There's no good books. I was reading the other day that one of the challenges right now for the school curriculum is if you start in kindergarten right now, you literally have no idea what jobs will even be available when your children graduate high school. How the heck do you design an educational curriculum for that? Yeah. Like, it's so dynamic. And so starting point needs to be sympathy and an understanding that no matter how bad of a parent you are, if you're there and you're present, you're doing a pretty dang good job. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's almost, you know, that's kind of what I've always said. It's wild, wild west and that I wouldn't know how to navigate things right now as far as, you know, being a parent or anything like that. Because, you know, sometimes I wonder, it's like, well, how am I doing on my own? You know, and, you know, and I, you know, I felt like I've done pretty well for myself. You know, I mean, I, I got a great job, you know, went to school, got my master's and all that. And, you know, have a very healthy lifestyle. And, you know, but again, you know, I sometimes we start talking about, you know, money and how, you know, that seems like one of the biggest issues now. Like, you know, you said jobs and, you know, with the cost of education nowadays, you know, I had friends come out of college and, you know, six figures in debt already. It's like, are we setting people oh, yeah. up for failure already? I mean, you know, you take a loan, like who was it? Was it Elon Musk that said, you know, we'll give a business owner, you know, $10,000, $20,000 loan. And, but when we, we don't give a kid that, but we'll let them take out a hundred thousand dollars to go to school. And, and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying we shouldn't go to higher education by any means, but, it's just wild that it's just like so unbalanced like that. And to me, it's just hard to navigate things like that. And, you know, I kind of, I beat myself up a little bit, you know, because, you know, I'm going to be 36 next month. And just, I'm kind of wondering, ah, did I really reach my life goals yet? You know, then should I have, you know, already tried to have kids, but it's like, well, no, Chris, you got it. You're pretty blessed, man. You could, uh, could be a lot worse situation than some of the other people that you, you, you know, you start looking around, you know, and I think that's where some of these downfalls fall and, you know, people my age and more males mainly, I don't know. It could be females too, but. I don't know. But yeah, that's one of the things I usually reflect on when I'm doing my journaling and stuff right now. So going back a little bit on that. Here's what I would encourage you to consider and everyone listening. I'm not by any means saying that everyone should have kids. I, I, it's not my business to get involved in that. Like you're an adult, you get to decide. But here's what I am saying. 
look at where the decision is coming from. If it's coming from a place of fear, of scarcity, of lack, question it. If it's coming from a place of calm, confidence, and peace, okay, you can roll with that. But yeah. so often we disguise, we'll, we'll rationalize or justify a fear of, oh, I probably wouldn't be a good parent. And even right now talking to you these few minutes, I can tell you with complete conviction, you have the potential to be an amazing parent. If nothing else, just your approach to life, your values, your striving towards those values. Like, I, I don't mean to speak poorly, but that puts you in the top tier of a lot of parents right there. Like, and parenting is stinking hard. I don't care if you're the best parent of the world. It's still stinking hard. But my question challenge to you is analyze in my heart. Is this fear? Is this scarcity? Is this lack? Because the, the truth is there is more goodness in the world than we can ever harness and take advantage of. And I mean this both ma literally, materially, physically, and I mean this metaphysically. The goodness out there is such that if you are willing to just go out there and challenge the world and say, I'm going to go out there and do this thing, you'd be shocked what happens. And you see this, like every great entrepreneurial story is exactly that. Every great hero story, um, Mother Teresa, like, you know, the woman spends 40 years in Calcutta, doesn't have a dime to her name. And look at the good she did because she challenged the world and said, I want to do something for the better. And I'm not calling you to go live in Calcutta, <laughs> but to, 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 to fight back into that fear that says, there's not enough out there. I'm not good enough. There's just, it's just too scary. It's just too much. It's responsible for me not to do that as a way of justifying that fear. And that's what I would caution against. Yeah. You know, I, I got this working theory. Well, I kind of probably stole it from somebody obviously, but you know, if you challenge yourself, you know, daily that it leads to longevity and you find out, you know, going back on, you find out what you're made of, make you more self-aware. And, you know, that's the reason I like doing these tough, hard workouts because, you know, I can put myself, you know, mentally and physically and just drain myself. And then, you know, if I go down the road and somebody cuts me off driving home, it's like, okay, no big deal, you know, but it's like, I've had worse things, but you know, if you continue to challenge yourself and challenge your mind and, and I'm not saying go out there and try to build a rocket or anything like that, but just do little small things. And, you, you know, again, you grow from and you learn about yourself and you learn what you can handle and what you're made of. And then you open up your mind to a whole new way of life, almost a new daily life. And it's just like the growth mindset from there is just, you know, just amazing, you know, and you just, I don't know. I guess all that information is coming in. It's like, man, I can do a lot more things than what I think I thought I was capable of. And you tell yourself that and kind of what we were touching on earlier. And it just, there's speaking positive about yourself. It just runs wild on yourself, man. You go crazy. And it's a, it's a good, it's a great feeling. It's a whole new energy. You'll never believe what you're capable of doing until you're actually going on doing it. Yeah. I had a, a good friend of mine, actually, I was working with him the other day and he good, solid job very responsible guy. He has six kids as well, actually. And he is so afraid to apply for this better job. And it's all comes down to here. The scarcity He's like, well, this job I have is really secure right now. You know, I, I've, I've made it. I'm comfortable. My family's living comfortable, but he doesn't really love the job. And there's this other job, a little bit more risk, but he loves the idea of doing what they're doing. I said, dude, just apply for it. He's like, but what if they go under? Like that's part of life. Yeah. If they do have the faith that you'll find something better. I mean, he's also the Christian perspective. We both believe that God wants to bless us with good things. I'm like, just go for it, man. And it's so hard because that feeling of scarcity of what if I do it and there's not enough? What if it goes under? What if it fails? What if I'm not good enough for it? Why risk the media, mediocre I have now in case it might go bad then? And my, I, my claim to him, to you, to everyone listening is exactly the opposite the meaning, the adventure of life is to take that risk, not unhealthily, but a healthy risk. In his case, he'd done his research. The company looked relatively stable. He was a great fit. Like, this wasn't a reckless move on his part. Take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen, man. You take a risk, man. Positive things happen. But, you know, again, you know, some people are probably scared of that success, right? Just because, oh, oh well, absolutely. if I do get it, you know, then they feel like, what, they got a target on their back and they can only go down from there. This is why most lottery winners, uh, all, almost all of lottery winners within two years are actually more poor than when they started. And the reason why that. is because in their head, they have an identity that I am able to handle this much money because that viewpoints in their head, it becomes true. And if you want to have more money, change how you think about yourself in terms of money. This sounds trite. You'd be like, Michael, that sounds like, you know, some sort of woo black magic. I'm like, no, it's nothing of the sort. The data is so clear that the power we have in our head to say, I'm choosing to think this about myself does create reality. I say this from a Christian perspective. I say this from a scientific perspective. And I say this as a life coach. All of that aligns perfectly to say the power of our thoughts is difficult to capture 
And if you want more money, you want more intimate relations with your spouse, significant other, whatever, you want more, whatever. Changing it up in your head is the key to unlocking it and making it happen. Yeah, just touching on that, you know, Mike Tyson, you know, he used to be have these negative thoughts before his fights and he'd be worried in his in the locker room, he'd go back and forth and whatever. But in his documentary documentary, right when he would walk up to the ring, he would say, like, I am a god. And when he'd walk in, and obviously, you know, he would just start knocking people out. But yeah, it was just the power of the mind. This is something that, you know, also again, it's something I've been learning about on this little podcast, self-awareness journey, whatever you want to call it, that I'm doing here. But yeah, it's just one of these things that you know, you control your thoughts, you control positive, you know, your mind, you control those positive thoughts coming in and out, man. You just, it'll do wonders for you again. Just like you said, just echoing what you said. It's just, I don't know. Well, I guess this, again, I just wish more people could, could get in that, you know, positive behavioral loop for themselves. Let me tell you a great study real quick. Okay. So I had an ACL surgery 10 years, 11 years ago now, horrible surgery, right? They rip your knee open, they fix your tendon, they put your knee back together, horrible recovery. Yeah. Here's the study. They take this group of people that all need knee surgery. They break into three groups. Group number one, they make the incision, close it back up. They, okay, group number two, they make the incision, open the knee up, close it all back up. Group number three, they actually do the surgery, make the incision, open the knee up, do the fix, put it all back together. Guess which group recovered at the, at the highest success rate? Uh, which one? They all tied. All three groups were told they had the surgery, even though two of them did not. It's like a placebo effect. Exactly. But think about that for a second. It's one thing to say you take a fake pain pill that's a sugar pill and your headache goes away. It's another thing to say that your knee recovers when you didn't have your tendon sewn back together just because your brain thought you did. Wow. <laughs> huh. That's an interesting right? statement. Yeah. Like, but I mean, think about that for a second. That's the power of the human brain. Like, yeah. if you believe that something is happening, you will act subconsciously in all these myriad of ways to make it true. And that is where I believe the power of life coaching comes in. And this is where people that I work with have these huge changes where just changing what's going on in their head, learning to look at the world differently. I've given you a couple of little examples, but like the real work is when you go down to the deepest part of identity about who I am, what am I worth? Am I good enough? Will I be good enough to have kids? Will I be good enough to hold down the better job? Am I responsible enough to handle extra money? These sort of questions transform your life. Do you think, and I know we're kind of getting short on time here, but do you think that majority of the population thinks kind of like that, that, you know, like, am I good enough? Will I be good enough as a father, mother, whatever? Will I make enough money? Do you think that's just the human brain just always being, or people just being in their own way, in their own worst enemy? So I, I need to clarify this tightly. I think most people, this rarely ever reaches the surface. But in terms of how their brain thinks, absolutely. Throughout most of time, Homo sapiens has lived in fear of predators, which means that if you hear a crack in the middle of the night and you do nothing, maybe you could eat and maybe you don't. But if you're eaten, you're done. Right. You hear a crack in the middle of the night and you react as if it's horrible, you're probably going to live. So we have been trained and conditioned to always assume the worst throughout all of our evolutionary tree, right? We've got 100 and whatever thousand years of being trained, assume the worst, assume it's not going to work make a backup plan, respond to that crack in the middle of the night as if it is a panther sneaking up on you. Because if you're wrong and it's not, that's fine. But if it, you're right and it is one, that's the only chance you have to not be eaten. And so deep, deep, deep down, we're always doubting. We're always questioning. And that sense of identity, especially given what I said earlier about our, our cultures and our tribes and our reinforcement mechanisms being lost, is what at the forefront of our attack, but we rarely are ever aware of that. There's an old movie called Inception where they go down to different yeah. levels of awareness, right? Like when I say identity, like that's like that bottom level down there. Rarely are we ever aware of what's actually happening down there. It surfaces up very, very sneakily. And to find out, you almost have to have someone else to help guide you down there. Maybe a really good set of questions that you're willing to take the risk and go deep, deep, deep down into your own heart and say, what's going on in here? How do I work? You know, Mike, we've, we've touched on a lot here, you know, as far as parenting, screens, technology, self-awareness, journaling. And, you know, and I, I like to ask some of my guests this question and just because of the conversation we've been having over the last little bit. But, I mean, you know, what gives you hope for the future? And What gives me hope? I think, boy, it's so it's such a complicated question. Yeah. But I think we, we're in the midst of all these different social experiments. Mm -hmm. And wherever you fall on the political spectrum, I think it's a safe thing to say that there's a lot of scariness happening. There's a lot of violence, a lot of strong emotions, um, a lot of big reactions. What gives me hope is I'm seeing more and more people choosing to not participate in that, to pull back out and say, you know what? 
the basic human connection, me going over to my neighbor and shaking hands with my neighbor, that matters more than all the 500,000 comments on Twitter. And I think when I, I, I talk to younger folks and I, I do some work with younger folks and I have a lot of friends that are younger folks and I hear them saying, you know what? I, I know all that stuff happens. That's just not real. There's a lot of hope that comes to me with that. I think as our world gets more and more chaotic, some people will dive on in and frolic in the chaos, but more and more people I think will pull back, resurface up and be like, nah, that's just not working for me. And that's all we need right there is as they do that, their brain opens to what does work, what's real, what's meaningful. Life coaching as an industry is growing exponentially because more and more people are saying, I don't want to live my life this way. And it's, it's a powerful starting point. Like I said, we take this one home on that right there. That was a good note to end on. Um, if you want to plug all your stuff, feel free to Absolutely. Right there, want to find you and all that good stuff. Tell them how they do that. Absolutely. So you can find me. I'm a Catholic. I'm proud to be a Catholic. I work with everyone who wants to come and talk to me. You can find me at Catholic Life Coach for Men. I do work with men. If you want to, if you're a woman, work with my wife. She's a life coach as well. But Catholic Life Coach for Men is a podcast. There's a website. Come check me out. Um, I'd love to talk to you. You can sign up for a free hour of talking. Costs you nothing. So if you got to look at this ugly mug. <laughs> Sorry, man. We our bald heads. We're good to go, man. We're okay. Exactly. <laughs> a lot of testosterone right here, right? <laughs> oh, all right, I got a quick joke for you. That you okay. know, God only made so many perfectly shaped heads in the world, and to everybody else, He gave a full head of hair to hide their shame. <laughs> right? Oh, I like that one, man. All right, I'm gonna have to remember that next time somebody gives me crap about my head. But cool, man. Yeah, that was great, man. This has been great. Um, appreciate you being here and taking the time having a little chat with me, man. This was fun. This was a good one. Chris, this was a fantastic conversation. Thank you for hosting. It's great to get to know you. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. We're out of here. Have a great evening.